It was a call heard around the hockey world. The famous Benino, Benino, Benino goal call from the 2016 Stanley Cup playoffs. And it's even how his book is introduced on page one, as I'm pleased to be joined by the voice of the infamous call, Mr. Harnarayan Singh, as we speak about his new book, One Game at a Time, and his journey from small town Alberta to hockey's biggest stage. Partner Ryan, thanks so much for doing this. Congratulations on your new book. How great is it for you personally to see this become a reality? Well, first of all, thanks so much, Tony, for the kind words. And, you know, I just watched uh, Tampa Bay and their players celebrate the Stanley Cup. And, and at that time, they are, you know, they're thanking everyone who got them to where they are at that point in their lives. And for me, the book uh, really that's kind of what it feels like for me in terms of where I am in my career. You just feel so thankful to, to your, your family, the support you got, friends, colleagues, producers, everyone who helped you get to where you are at this point. So that's where, that's how I'm feeling a very exciting time in my career and, and for my family as well. Well, Harden Ryan, there's also plenty mentioning of the Edmonton Oilers in your book, uh, including a photo of you in your Favorite PJs growing up. I'm not sure if the viewers can see that, uh, but you were, of course, born in Wetaskiwin, grew up in Brooks, uh, and your first present was a, was a Northlands Coliseum hockey stick. Is that right? That's, that's right. So being born in Wetaskiwin and my, my aunt and my cousins were living there, and so uh, the first present I received was a mini hockey stick, and it's, it was white, and it had a wooden blade. Uh, and it said Northlands Coliseum on there. And that was basically the beginning of it. And, you know, growing up in the 80s with uh, the Oilers being such a tremendous team and, of course, Wayne Gretzky, Gary Curry, Grant Fear, the list goes on. Uh, it was hard not to be an Oilers fan, but we took it to another level. I mean, we are uh, ourselves as a family. We were so obsessed and um, my hockey card collection was so extensive and I had the the Gretzky cards at the at the front and just just everything and anything to do with the Oilers uh, grew up uh, just basically you know totally obsessed with that team and and uh, they helped fuel the passion uh, for the game of hockey. That's tremendous. The Oilers, of course, playing in that building from 1974 to 2016, dating back to its WHA days. Uh, again, the photo of you in your pajamas. But uh, <laughs> Wayne Gretzky also used a white. Titan uh, probably looked similar to that Northlands Coliseum hockey stick. We'll get to Gretzky in just a few moments, but maybe take us through your childhood, Nahar Narayan, and even meeting Glenn Anderson in Brooks, Alberta. Yeah, and so, you know, uh, my parents are teachers now retired and academic minds, and my dad being a PhD in math, seven post-secondary degrees, he was worried that I was creating my brain into this encyclopedia of hockey and he's like, what are you going to do with it? And, uh, but you know, it's so, it's so cool because they actually also, despite them being concerned about that, my parents also nurtured it. And when my dad saw an, uh, an ad in the paper in the Brooks Bulletin, the one paper we had at the time there in that small town, uh, that Glenn Anderson was going to be at a gas station of all places. And so... <laughs> He's like, do you want to go? And I said, of course. So we go there and Glenn Anderson is signing autographs. And it's hilarious because the picture of him is fully dressed in his hockey gear and his Oilers uniform and everything. And he's pumping gas right at this <laughs> gas station. And so when he signs my autograph, he's like, hey, hey, how do you spell your name? And we were just joking about that with your producers and, uh, and yourself too, Tony, uh, that he starts writing my name. So I'm like, H-A-R. And, and like he didn't have any room left and so by the end of my name it's just like these squiggles but that was like I put that on my bedroom door it was such a cool moment for me to to be able to meet him and and to, to have that. Well obviously a tremendous story meeting Glenn Anderson but also in your book Harn Ryan you mentioned how hockey has helped you as a visible minority during your childhood maybe expand on that. Yeah, just when you are a child and, you know, in the town of Brooks, there wasn't very much diversity at all. And when I showed up at school, uh, you know, 
I was very different and it, it's it just, you wear it on your sleeve because it's front and center and I was the subject of a ton of curiosity and often singled out. And so you're looking for common ground because you know the food I ate was different, the language we spoke at home was different, the music I listened to was different. And, and hockey became that commonality for me where I was able to create a rapport with other classmates and teachers. And had it not been for hockey, Tony, my entire childhood would have been drastically different. I, there was other boys in my class who were bigger and stronger skating and playing ice hockey. I wasn't one of those because my family, we weren't skating, but I was a hockey obsessed nut. And what ended up happening is, is that some of those boys were, they, they kind of found it cool that I was so obsessed with hockey. And they said, hey, if anybody bothers you, make sure you come and tell them that they have to go through us. Uh, but, you know, and later on in my life in the same town, one of those boys, uh, when 9-11 happened in New York, he later on, I talk about this in the book too, and he grabbed me from the throat and threw me up against the cement wall in the hallway and, you know, said all sorts of obscenities and said, go back to where you came from. I can't believe you did this. And I knew that guy for, you know, a decade and we were in the same classes uh, so there's there's a lot of great, fun, positive hockey stories in there, but there's also a, a sense of reality about, um, you know, some of the things that I feel that we really need to talk about in Canada because uh, racism still is there. Definitely. And uh, we actually talk about uh, more on the uh, not so hockey side a little bit later on in this interview. But uh, Harnarine, uh, let's get back to the good stuff on the ice. Uh, on chapter two, it's it's got its title, Wayne's World. Now, we exchanged some messages and notes last night about your book. So I'm using your words here and not mine and asking about your obsession with Wayne Gretzky growing up. Uh, maybe tell us how that all started. And, and if I'm not mistaken, it started with the day uh, you were born. Yeah, and I, you know, I, my I, my sisters were already Gretzky fans, and we were growing up during the time the Oilers were in their dynasty and winning all the Stanley Cups. And you know, what was really cool for me is, so my parents did a great job of maintaining our faith and heritage. And so we were learning about our, the, the six scriptures and the meanings and, and all this stuff. And it's like, you know, one of the big elements of the six scriptures is to uh, become a humble person and leave your ego at the door. And <clears throat> when you think about Wayne Gretzky, like one of, the, one of the biggest characteristics that stands out is how humble the guy is. He was breaking all of Gordie Howe's records, giving Gordie Howe so much respect, always giving credit to his teammates, just how he carried himself off it on and off the ice but uh, even you know when when Gretzky got traded I remember my sisters crying and like it was such a traumatic moment for us and you know with him getting the tissue and he's crying on that press conference and it was like he's gone and we couldn't even believe it and then from there everything switched to the Kings eventually to the Blues and the Rangers um, yeah. but you know it, it was it was amazing we had an opportunity to meet Wayne Gretzky um, while he was playing five times five authentic autographs each wow. with its own amazing story uh, attended the last game that Gretzky ever played in the NHL in Calgary and believe this or not and I talk about this in the book the last two and a half minutes of that game the Saddledome crowd the Flames fans were all standing and chanting Gretzky non-stop till the end of the yeah. game uh, such respect that he deserved and then charity uh, charity golf tournaments with Gretzky where we had a chance to follow him around uh, I have an autographed picture with my sister and I and Gretzky sitting in a golf cart. And the year after he, <laughs> we had that picture with us and he autographed it. And then of course, Tony, uh, just, um, I got to meet him in at the NHL 100 uh, when the NHL celebrated a hundred years in LA and he was in the same restaurant as my colleagues and I And get this. We were blown away that Gretzky was just a couple of tables away. We're trying to figure out like, how do we go up and like, is it be a bother in Wayne Gretzky comes up to our table and he says, hey, guys, I love what you're doing. And it was such a special moment. And then I got to uh, when I covered uh, the Oilers in, in place of Gene Principe for a few games on the California road trip, got to chat with him there, too. Just as advertised, I would say even better as advertised. The sport couldn't have had a better ambassador. And safe to say he's also one of the funniest human beings I've ever met. He has a story for everything, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, definitely. And, <laughs> and just, I mean, you, you just think about how popular and how in demand this, this gentleman is and how he gives everybody so much time and respect. Yeah. That's, it's so admirable. All right. So definitely uh, the obsession with 99 was in high gear. But 
uh, growing up in Alberta, watching the Oilers, did you have any other favorite Oilers other than Wayne Gretzky? Well, actually, I, before we move on to that, you might notice this license plate here. That's oh, if, yes. If, yes. I've got 99 <laughs> on my license plate. We had a Gretzky shrine in the room. But uh, going on to other players, you know, Curtis Joseph was my, is my all-time favorite goaltender. And those years where the Oilers, it seemed like they were playing Dallas every single year in the playoffs for such a big stretch. And, uh, you know, my family and I, we ended up, we, were, we hated Dallas in those days. And the Oilers were underdogs in those years uh, when they when they beat Colorado in seven and I remember that Todd Marchand goal in overtime where he goes on the breakaway and uh, you know so Curtis Joseph was a big one and and uh, you know the, the years where the Oilers had Jason Arnett, Bill Guerin and and Doug Waite those were some fun times too but you gotta love Ryan Smith you gotta give him some love because he was uh, one of the most popular players post Gretzky era and uh, he just epitomized what an oiler was and uh, those were some really fun years. Yeah my apologies for not uh, pointing out the 99 uh, uh, license <laughs> plate you got the photo of Gretzky behind you you got the pro star cereal box the whole nine 99 yards we yards. should say. <laughs> uh, now of course you do tremendous work with Sportsnet, Hockey Night in Punjabi and Flames TV and have great support from family, friends and your colleagues including myself but partner Ryan this wasn't always the case for you. Maybe talk about how you were initially discouraged to not go into broadcasting is something you elaborate on in your book. Yeah, when you're a kid, uh, oftentimes people are always asking, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a hockey commentator. And it was often met with laughter. And it was often met with a cautionary tale of, well, Harnerein, you should be realistic. There's not anyone who looks like you on TV. There's especially not any diversity in sports television. And so the chances of you getting there are slim to none. And especially in our South Asian community, you know, Tony, uh, firsthand, it's normally doctor, lawyer, engineer. <laughs> yeah. That's what's being pushed. And um, so it was, it was really, uh, it, was, it was an interesting thing for me because I've actually only realized even more recently how much it affects you on, in your psyche. And it, it just creates the seed of doubt that even when you get that opportunity, like, are you, am I sure I should, I'm good enough to actually do this? And so I was told that so many different times um, whether that was in the town of Brooks from some professionals we knew, or even when I landed in broadcast school, uh, there were some teachers saying that, you know, maybe for you behind the scenes as a producer is the shot that you would get, or if you had a shot on, uh, on the air, it would just be news. And so, uh, but what had ended up happening is when I would get those kind of discouraging comments, I would also have the support of my parents who said, give it a shot. This is your dream. And I also had the town of Brooks, the one radio station we had, they gave me an opportunity to do high school news and sports on the air. And that is literally the only reason why I decided that, Hey, if these guys can give me a shot, maybe someone else will down the road. And from there, uh, I'm very grateful to say, Things came to fruition, but it wasn't always a smooth ride. It took a lot of uh, hard work and effort. It took a lot of going above and beyond and, and, you know, paying for my flights for a few years and things like that. But yeah. very grateful to have it come to fruition. Uh, that was my next question, Hardner Ryan. Maybe take us through the origin of your broadcasting career with Hockey Night in Punjabi and how that all started. Yeah, so I, I after broadcast school, I got an internship with TSN, and and then after that, started working with CBC Radio as a reporter. But I was I wasn't in sports at that time. I was doing local news and trying to figure out if this is if I could make this work or not. And uh, lo and behold, uh, CBC Sports at the time decided to do Hockey Night Punjabi, and they had tried a different a number of different languages, but when they tried Punjabi, it just took off. And here we are in our 13th season. But initially, this was just like a pilot project, and I'm not sure anybody knew what was in store for the future. And so uh, the show was based in Toronto, and it didn't make sense for me to uh, move out to Toronto for one day of week. And at that time, it was you know uh, it wasn't necessarily financially viable either to do that uh, cost of living wise and and what we were getting paid so I just decided my foot was finally in the door I was you know a part of the hockey night in Canada family and so from there it was like I got to do whatever it takes to make this long term and uh, and to make 
to make this work. And so I started paying for my own flights without telling anybody, any of my superiors, because they would have thought I was a lunatic. And they would have thought that, uh, you know, I would have been maybe potentially unreliable. But uh, yeah, I, I paid for my own flights for a while, slept at the wow. Pearson International Airport and uh, took a bunch of red eyes, lost a lot of sleep in those years. But I was yeah. young enough back then to be able to withstand it. Uh, but I'm happy to say, uh, as you mentioned, people who've supported me, guys like Kelly Rudy, um, also an executive with uh, with Hockey Night in Canada, Joel Darling. When they when they found out what was going on by that time, I had proved my commitment, and they went to bat for me. And so here I am today. You mentioned your support, and uh, just a quick question on the forward uh, by Ron McLean. Uh, obviously, he's probably somebody that you watched and idolized uh, when you were growing up, just like myself. To get uh, his almost stamp of approval, uh, what does that kind of mean for you? It's so tremendous, so special, Tony. And you you mentioned it right there. I grew up watching Ron and I had a toy microphone um, that my parents got me and I used to pretend to be Ron hosting the NHL awards. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is just such a tremendous individual, so genuine, so down to earth. And his memory is, you know, I, I would put any genius's memory up there with his and the way he is with words. And he's given my family and myself so much love and respect over the years. And he's been a champion of our show. He's the type of guy who I call up for advice or um, for mentorship as well. And so uh, it's really special for me to have, uh, to have Ron write the foreword for the book. Yeah, he's uh, such a tremendous human being, just much like the great one himself. A uh, quick story that maybe I can share with you, Harden Ryan, is when I, was sure. in TV, when I was in TV school, I had the opportunity to volunteer for Rogers Hometown Hockey, obviously hosted by Ron McLean and the great Tara Sloan. And I couldn't even believe it. Somehow, some way, I got myself into the Sportsnet truck and I w happened to be watching the Oilers versus Montreal Canadiens game and Ron McLean was to my left and somehow Mark Messi was to my right. I was literally sandwiched between greatness. And there, was, there I was just, just a, a, a naive uh, broadcasting student. And I just remember Ron McLean was asking me a bunch of questions, really asked about my childhood, really asked about my upbringing, what wanted me uh, to propel myself into broadcasting. And I remember just a couple of things. I, I always play a quick game with everyone at Oilers TV. Whenever there's a shootout, that game went to a shootout. I always try to call whatever the shot will be. And I remember calling, I believe it was Drysaddle, McDavid, and I cannot remember the third one. I want to say Ryan Nugent Hopkins. And I called all three what they were going to do. And he just looked at me and he's like, that was actually really impressive. So just goes to the <laughs> tremendous character uh, that uh, is displayed by Mr. Ron McLean through and throughout. But uh, we did also mention Harn Ryan. It's been a tremendous career for you so far. But this book, One Game at a Time, isn't just about hockey. You obviously talked about the reality and the very serious uh, thing that happened back in 9 11. Uh, maybe share some, some of the stories that you share at One Game at a Time so that the people can look forward to when they pick up the book. Yeah, you're you're totally right, Tony. It's it's not just a hockey book. I think it's a message that resonates with a lot of people. And I'll give you an example. My editor on the book, uh, his name's Joe Lee, he's from originally from Oshawa, Ontario. He's from Korean descent. And when he was talking about my book to his colleagues, he became emotional about it, and it really hit home for me because uh, he said that there there's so many parallels to his childhood. Uh, with the story that's written here in the book of my journey too. And, I, and that really struck a chord and made me realize that there's so many people of color out there who've uh, experienced, you know, some traumatic racist moments throughout their lives. And, you know, hockey for them is really what made them feel better and, and put, put everything together. And so I think that this book is a, a really necessary positive message. We, we're seeing so much happen in the world right now that is dividing us. And there's so much rhetoric out there um, spreading hate and and I think if we really look at it, we could celebrate our our differences and uh, through the power of sport, which is a unifying force. I mean, you look at the Edmonton Oilers fan base, um, you look at you being a part of the Edmonton Oilers and, uh, you know, this brings us together and, and it doesn't matter what our background is, what how we look, we can all be there together supporting our local team, cheering them on. And I think so that's why this is such a necessary positive message about diversity through the lens of a hockey broadcaster. And 
It also will provide perspective to others. And some of the messages that I've received, Tony, have been just un unbelievable. Uh, one, one person who was a classmate of mine in Brooks who I had never kept in touch with, but she messaged saying that she had no idea I was going through what I was going through, even though we were right beside each other in the same classroom in the same yeah. hallways, right? So it provides that authentic perspective too, that, um, you know, a, per a person who's different can easily be singled out and has to go through a lot of uh, obstacles and challenges to try to fit in. And so it, it is a positive hockey book, but there's a lot of reality in there too, which I believe as Canadians, we should have this conversation so that we can learn to respect one another even more. And one final note, uh, you also want to leave a message to youngsters nowadays with your book. Uh, maybe if you want to share that, the platform is yours. Yeah, and my message is that, hey, look, if a person like myself with a turban and a beard and who was told that this was impossible, if I can make it, you do whatever it is you want to achieve in this country. And I also want to say that, you know, my parents came here in the 60s. My great grandfather came here over 100 years ago, and those times were completely different. My great grandfather didn't have the, the right to buy land. He didn't have the right to vote. Uh, my parents experienced a lot of challenges in the 60s in Alberta. Had it not been for, for them succeeding and getting through all of those obstacles, we, Tony, yourself and myself, we wouldn't have those, these opportunities that we have in front of us today had it not been for them going through what they did. So I, I want to say that it's always important for us to acknowledge uh, the past. And But now the situation is we live in the best country in the world because it doesn't matter who you are. The opportunities are there. Don't let anybody ever tell you you can't do what you want to do. Well, Hart and Ryan, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on for this exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with Oilers TV. I'm so honored to now call you a friend. Congratulations on your new book, buddy. Appreciate the kind words, Tony. Thanks so much for having me on Oilers TV.